Good afternoon, Brian. Thank you for joining us on the Path to Follow podcast. This is the first episode. Um, we're just going to talk. We're just going to have a good time in here for how long do you have? However long you need. All right. Until uh, Gilman School ends at 3 o'clock in the elementary school. Awesome. And I think we're playing pickleball at 3 o'clock if you want to get out there. I will join you. Really? <clears throat> Maybe. It's awesome. Uh, Brian is the first guest on the podcast. He is my mentor. This is the first episode that, that we're airing here. So um, we're calling this podcast the Path to Follow podcast because Path to Follow was a movie that came out last year about Reddy Finney, a legendary figure in Gilman's history, headmaster, um, and, and he really made Gilman what it is today. So we're going to have a lot of different faculty members on and, and just talk to them and learn a little bit more about your path and how you came to Gilman, how you became a teacher, what motivates you every day in the classroom and on the field and whatever else you do. Um, so to start off, though, I do have a gift <laughs> for Brian being the first guest on the podcast. There we go. Amazing. Wow. The Brand Gil new uh, English department pullover here. You got to show it off. Okay. You got to show it to the camera. That's uh, Pete Scott. Hook those up. This is a uh, boathouse original, maybe. <laughs> so we we need to get the whole English department outfitted. Man, quarter zips can't have enough of them. <laughs> we we do have a lot of those. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, feel lucky to, to be here. Awesome. So Brian, right off the bat, do you want to just talk a little bit about how you got into teaching as a career? What how how did you start off, and you know what kind of led you to this profession? Sure, yeah. Um, both my parents are educators, as I think I've shared with you. Um, and um, I think when I graduated college, I thought I wanted to get into outdoor education. I was living in Boulder, Colorado with some friends. Um, and uh, really, it was after September 11, and um, uh, a teacher at St. Paul's School got called up to active duty. Um, and I had, at that point, sort of... Um, signed up for Carney Sando and other placement agencies and got pretty lucky, I think, got a phone call. It got flown out to Baltimore and um, sort of started that winter. Um, yeah, I think I, I, think I um, didn't want to follow in the footsteps of my parents. I had grand ideas about making tons of money um, and uh, still, I think, returned back to it and, and uh, have been doing it since then, 2002. So, so what was it like for you kind of growing up? It was a boarding school, right? Where you, where it, you started. It was a day, it was a day school. It was a day yeah. school, yeah. but you were, you were on campus. You were living on campus right. growing up there. What was it like being like the son of a, of a head of school and growing up in that, in that lifestyle? Yeah, I think that's what I, that was really what brought me back to it. I, I, I've actually written a little bit about this sort of in personal essay style, but I was, um, driving from Boulder up into the mountains to see some friends and it was a Friday night and it was in the fall and I was driving past all these high schools sort of the Friday night lights and feeling the kind of pull to turn in um, even though I didn't know the schools I didn't know anybody there um, and I think on that drive and I was by myself and sort of doing a lot of soul searching um, I sort of recognized that that pull and I mean I had as, as you just said I my dad was a headmaster. I grew up on, you know, private school campuses and spent a lot of time, you know, physically on campus and appreciating the feel. And, and again, it really wasn't until that night that I sort of thought um, I might need to get back involved and, and get back on campus and, and feel, you know, that connection and that, um, you know, make those relationships. So this is just right after college. You're yeah. out. You're out in Boulder, and you were doing some kind of outdoor experience. What, what exactly were you doing out there? Because <laughs> I I do have a connection to Boulder. My parents yeah, right. met there. My mom grew up in Boulder. I've been out there a ton. Yeah, it's an amazing place. But what what led you to Boulder, Colorado? How'd you get out there? Yep, I was just with some friends. A, a buddy of mine was at CU, finishing at CU, and I was living with him and working at. BD's Mongolian Barbecue, um, and was working on a trail crew like Boulder County Parks and Open Space, um, and just applying for a ton of jobs. I think I wanted to work for Outward Bound, or I wanted to work for Knowles, one of those, you know, outdoor ed, outdoor adventure companies, um, and, you know, wasn't having a whole lot of luck. Um, 
And I think, you know, I realized that if I got into teaching, then I could still have my summers to sort of do that kind of work, which was also, you know, exciting for me. And, um, but yeah, my friends, a lot of my friends actually moved out there during college and after college. And so I was just sort of hanging out with them, trying to, trying Trying to to live the good life. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Trying to figure out what you wanted to do. Exactly. And your first teaching job was at Gilman. You came to Gilman. Was that, it was at St. Paul's. So it was like a part-time job. I was a lower middle school PE yep, yep. teacher and coach. Um, and then applied, you know, that winter, like right away or that, yeah, late winter started applying for jobs and, and had met some folks at, at Gilman. And, um, at the time John Schmick was the upper school head and uh, I applied for a English job and got it. Um, so started that next you know summer as a football coach and 11th grade English teacher. So I, I should say that, that Brian's my mentor, and when I started teaching here at Gilman, he was kind of the guy who, who held my hand and walked <laughs> me through like the day-to-day life. I had no idea what I was doing. Still probably am, am trying to figure it out, but Brian gave me such a leg up by letting me kind of follow his curriculum, observe his classes, um, you know, give me tips and, and different things that he's learned over the years. Did you have some kind of similar mentorship when you started at Gilman, you know, in your first year of teaching? Did you have someone help you out like that or were you kind of just thrown into the classroom? Yeah, there wasn't quite as much um, structure in place uh, in terms of like new faculty at that point. Um, John Schmick and Tom Previs and I, all the same age, all the same experience started that same year. We, we, We were all in the same office and I think we joke that we're the reason that there is a new teacher orientation because we made, I think, so many mistakes. But um, Claudia DeSantis was an English teacher at the time and looked out for me and, and sort of showed me the ropes. Mr. Mr. Chris, Jeff Christ was the English department chair. Um, Eva Turner was the then, you know, incoming upper school head. Um, so I had tons of people to lean on, you know, Timmy Holly as the AD and English teacher. Um, uh, Joe Ehrman helped me out that first fall on the sidelines. Um, so I was able, you know, I was just incredibly fortunate to have awesome teaching colleagues and coaching colleagues. And I made lots of mistakes, but, um, you know, the, the kids stuck with me and my, you know, teacher friends stuck with me. And there was a lot of young people too around at the time that made it a lot of fun and, you know, excited to stick around. Yeah. Great. Was there ever a time when you started out and and I kind of, I mean, I never really thought this because I had so much support in my first couple of years here through the Penn Fellowship Mm -hmm. program, but was there there ever a time when you were teaching and, and, you know, as a 23, 24 year old and you're like, maybe this isn't the path for me, maybe (laughs) this is, I mean, it's hard, it's hard, especially being in the classroom for the first time and like these kids, these kids here are very smart and they're asking all kinds of questions. And yeah. Was there ever a time when you're like, maybe I want to get back out to Boulder, try something else? Yeah. Or were you kind of sticking with it that whole time? Yeah, I think I, I am incredibly grateful for those. I had three sections of um, juniors and I, and I know a lot of their names still. I remember a lot of those faces and those whatever, 45 students um, really looked out for me. And I think they knew I wasn't very good at my job, but that I was trying hard. And I think they gave me good feedback and they were... um... (laughs) They they turned out the lights. Gilman's power saving now. Oh, true. Initiative. Sorry. Um, Sure. Students yeah, I mean, looked I, out for you. I think that that first uh, those first three classes of juniors, and I'm I'm grateful that they were juniors and a little bit more mature potentially than ninth graders would have been. Um, and they were just really generous and really gracious. Um, and I was a head JV football coach, and that was something that felt really like natural. And I felt like I was actually pretty good at that, with especially with the support that I had. Um, yeah, it, it was a grind. I mean, I think. Um, you know, once I started going to grad school a couple of years later and started doing some college counseling stuff um, and was still coaching and, and teaching, you know, three sections, um, those were, I think, in some ways harder years than those first couple of years where I didn't have as much responsibility and was just trying to be a good teacher and a good coach and could go home and, you know, grade papers and go to bed. Um, Less on your plate. Yeah, yeah. So, 
um, I think it felt it felt right pretty early on, and um, and I was involved all over the place. I mean, I think Gilman, you know, opened a ton of doors for me and, and gave me lots of opportunities to try new things, as I think we've tried to do with you. And, um, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for that. Awesome. So you were at Gilman for for how long, kind of starting off, yep. and then and then you made a, a move out to California, and then right. now you, you've come back, back into a different role at right. Gilman. What was that kind of process like for you, or kind of explain those years where you went out to California and then returned? Yep, so got married in 2006 and um, was trying to kind of finish a grad degree at Hopkins. Um, and when I finished that grad degree in, in 09, um, I think we sort of felt like that had been my grad school turn and, and we decided to sort of take turns and Dana decided to apply to business schools. Um, and I tried to get a job in each of the places where she had been um, admitted. Um, and one of those places was the Bay Area. So she got into Cal and I got a job in San Francisco. And um, so in 2010, we moved out there and I was an English teacher at Drew School. Um, and spent some time as an English department chair and a summer program guy. And so again, that, that really lucky that a school that gave me lots of opportunities. Um, and we lived out there for five years and uh, came back. I think she finished her degree. We had two babies, um, realized it was a sort of tough place to make a, make a life uh, um, financially and for a lot of reasons. And also, you know, however many thousands of miles away from our families. And um, so we decided to sort of come back east and we looked in North Carolina and we looked in Baltimore and Ohio and, you know, it was psyched to come back to Gilman in this new position. And what, what is Drew School like? So I, I've, I've been out to California, I've yeah. been to San Francisco. I think I've, I've seen Drew School or at least applied to one of their programs. But hmm. w how did you, um, I think they might have actually had an opening when I was kind of looking huh. to get into teaching and I okay. was looking at San Francisco and out west. Right. And, and um, Drew struck my interest, but how did you find out about Drew and like what what did you do out there that was different from what you were doing at Gilman? Yeah, so most of the schools, the private schools in the Bay Area are, um, uh, you know, high school, the high schools are high school only schools. Um, so, and there are many in that area, sort of like Baltimore and Philadelphia and DC. Um, I think, I, again, I, I was just looking for any job where, you know, in a city where Dana had, you know, had gotten in. Um, yep. And this was the one that sort of where I matched. I looked at also at um, Head Royce and a couple other places um, and just got this English teaching job. It's a small um, high you know, nine through 12 co-ed school. Um, I think it sees itself as a pretty progressive place. Um, and it's right in you know Pacific Heights. It's right in the incredible city of San Francisco. Um, and we lived in Berkeley, so I was commuting back and forth. Awesome. And you were coaching out there a little bit too? You yep. Were... So coached basketball at Drew and started a lacrosse program at Drew and then quickly um, got an opportunity to coach at Cal, the, the men's club lacrosse team, um, and so did that for three seasons, which was amazing. Um, yeah, you, so, you talk about that a lot. You like that experience yeah. coaching Cal. And yeah, I think for the same reason, I you know, that it's awesome to coach at Gilman. I mean, just really, really smart kids. Yeah. And they, it's not, you know, they, they were playing lacrosse because they wanted to, not because they were, like, on scholarship or whatever. Um, but they still they, they still take it very seriously, very seriously out there because yeah. they're sort of good. Yeah. What, what's that league called? MCLA? MCLA, which yeah. has, I think, gotten more and more competitive and, and yep. more and more, like, full-time head coaches. Um, when I was there, it was all of us were – it was our second job, um, including the head coach. Um, now, Ned Webster, who's a Baltimore guy, a good friend of mine, is the head coach, and that's his full-time job. Um, and his buddy is the head coach at Stanford. And, you know, there are, there are now, you know, it's just becoming, I think, more and more legit. And I think those California kids and West Coast kids, it's like, okay, do I play at Cal, right, one of the best, you know, public universities in the world, or do I go to – Amherst and Massachusetts, right? Or, you know, they're, the they're deciding the between, right. Like sometimes if they're good enough, they're deciding between going to play at Cornell or play at one of the Ivy leagues or yeah. stay and go to Stanford or go to Cal and, and play club. You know, I think it's probably 
a matter of time before that program is yeah. Division One, and, and some of those schools start Stanford popping up. I yeah. mean, they have a really good women's team. Right, and it's um, D1, right. I mean, the women's lacrosse out there is really, and has been. USC is yeah. really good. Right. C, Boulder, they have a team, CU. CU. Yeah. They're good women, so I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's only you know a matter of time. I think so. Happens. I mean, it's a money it's a money thing, and the yep. University of California system is is floundering. So, um, but places like Stanford have more money than they know what to do with, and yep. you know, places like Oregon or you know some of those schools I think could do it, and I think they've talked about it in the same way Utah has you know yeah. established a program. It'd be interesting to see where Utah is in the next couple of years. Right. I'm sure you know they'll, they'll get all those kids out west. Right. Right. And stay home. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've never been. Have you been to Utah? Have you been to Salt Lake? I have. Yeah. What's What's it like out there? And it's a lot like Boulder, I think. I mean, it, you know, diff- sort of different, different, a little bit of a different scene. Just the Utah sort of life is different than the Colorado life, but you know, yep. mountainous and active and outdoors fun. and skiing. Yeah. 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 Right. So it'll be easy for and them young. to track. Yeah. yeah. Right. Track a bunch of guys out there. Right. So. A lot of our guys, I think, that recently graduated and are currently not in school are living in Utah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, just as a cool just place a great to live. Spot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So awesome. So when you came back to Gilman your second time, how did your how did your role change from those years after college when you were here as a 23, 24 year old kind right. of figuring out, you know, how, how to teach and the best practices in the classroom? Right. I understand your role changed a little bit right. after you got back from Drew. So what, what were your new responsibilities? So I was a finalist or or was was under consideration for a period of time for the assistant head of school job that Bart Griffith got. Um, and when Henry sort of called and said, you know, you're no longer in contention, Rob basically called the next day and said, um, you know, we'd like to consider you for this role, which at the time didn't exist. So the lower school had an assistant head and the middle school had an assistant head, but the upper school did not. Um, so, you know, obviously I was really pumped. Um, at the time I was in touch with Ravenscroft School in Raleigh and was going to potentially be the English department chair. So that was the sort of only other thing I had going. Um, and this, I think, was a, had more responsibility and more leadership um, sort of potential. Um, and my mom is here, my sister is here. So I think Dana and I were pretty excited about coming back to Baltimore. Um, and I think Rob and I have, you know, sort of figured it out over the last few years in terms of what my responsibilities are and how we can best work together. And I end up, um, I think doing a lot of the hiring stuff, which is really fun and uh, kind of thinking about teaching and learning in the realm of our professional growth model. Right. And, um, observing teachers and working with teachers. Um, you know, we developed that student perspective survey that I think is, has, has shifted the way w- we think about student feedback and student input. Um, I manage the community time, which in our current uh, circumstances is sort of weird, but that's yep. usually a really fun and interesting and, and ch- you know, challenging responsibility um, to just sort of put that together and figure out how that works. Um, I was thinking about that a little bit yesterday when I was meeting with my advisees because yeah. I was going, this is my first year with advisees, so I was going off the the Google calendar with the three point, it was like something that's working well, something that's challenging or difficult, yeah. and then something you anticipate in the next coming weeks right. with, with coronavirus and moving into phase three. Right. And I was like, this is just perfect for Brian being an English teacher to pose these three <laughs> questions because I remember you doing that a lot when I was observing you and it's it's just a great way to kind of get because my group had a great conversation about that so cool um, yeah I had my my advisees write interim comments for themselves which was really interesting to see their you know self reflection or self analysis I guess um, yeah that's fun to do again it's been really weird this year and I feel like we haven't quite gotten it right um, I think we're also just trying to protect that time for teachers to be able to, pre- you know, prep for the next day or prep for the next week, you know, just save sort of teacher prep time um, and not fill the schedule in the afternoons. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, I think assemblies are awesome. Assemblies are where you really feel the sort of like warmth and connection of the upper school. And, you know, yeah, we're, so we're, we're missing that. We're yeah. definitely missing the yeah. assembly time. Yeah. And the yeah. different speakers. And that's one thing with this podcast uh, yeah. that I'm hoping like we have some really cool speakers that come and right. talk to our boys on campus. I'm hoping that I can use this in a way that 
right. you know, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation that people can watch afterwards. And, right. you know, the alumni, the people who weren't here had to miss can, right. can kind of learn a little bit more. Yeah, totally. I think so hopefully that, hopefully that works out when we're out of this, <laughs> out of this phase. Yeah. Uh, we might back. need to build a new auditorium, uh, <laughs> in order to get, you know, the upper school safely into one space, but get the distance, couple, yeah. couple seats in between. Yeah. Two, two levels maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. So, so as an English teacher and I observed you for, for that whole first year and yep. kind of followed your curriculum. Are there any books, short stories, or like what, what's your favorite thing to teach in English? And I was thinking Edgar Allan Poe is probably one of my favorites. And yeah. I was trying to get this across on Zoom to my class today, how much <laughs> I love Poe. And like, he's a Baltimore guy. And, um, but I, I would probably say put like the, these few weeks right now, like the Poe are some of, your favorites, are yeah. some of my favorites, especially just in the fall, it seems right to, to do Edgar Allan Poe yeah. for some reason. Yeah. But is there any, any author or book that you just, you have a passion for and you can't wait to, to teach to your class? Yeah, I think I, you know, forever I saved, especially with the junior class, I saved a contemporary novel for the end of the year, which, you know, you have done also. And, and one of my favorites that you're going to teach also this spring is The Road. Um, and, and I just love teaching that. Or, and I haven't taught it in a while, but I, I love teaching it in, in the in, in past years. Um, just how different it is, right? And the unbelievable connection between the father and the son. Obviously, have you know having two sons, I feel, you know, even closer to the dad, uh, to Papa in the in the novel. Um, so I taught that a bunch of years, and always loved coming back to it and finding new lines and sort of seeing it through a different set of students eyes um similar to that uh you know i, I made note of uh, gilead which is the marilyn robinson novel written it's epistolary so written in the form of letters um from father to son also um uh, so for a lot of the same reasons and it's not as it's not as unique in terms of sort of you know verbal style in terms of like how it's written but it's unique in its in its letter form and it's uh also similarly um, rich and um, sort of every time I read it, I, I find something new. Um, I so those are those are two that come to mind. Yeah, Marilyn Robinson is is remarkable. I've read Housekeeping by her in college, but I've not read Gilead yet. Yeah, and there's a whole series, and I think that there's a new one that either just came out or is about to come out. So she wrote um, Gilead, and then Home, and Lila, and I think the new one is called Jack, and they all take place in Gilead. I'll have to I'll have to add that to the reading stack. Yeah, the, she's... the librarians at Gilman are like, dude, when do you have time to read all these books? <laughs> right. like, I check out a book like a, you know every day in there. So yeah, luckily Diane's got that place absolutely stocked with everything. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's yeah. great. Yeah, and they're do they have a good system in there right now where you like you have to put on the gloves and you keep your distance, okay. but like it's it's pretty COVID safe in okay. there, which is. Which is good. I think the the, the library on Roland Avenue is like quarantining books for a period of days. So really? Yeah, we put we put books on hold for Ben, and <laughs> they have to like sit there for a period of days, oh which is, is like scary but sort of awesome at the same time. Yeah, um, they're doing a good job. Yeah. So for Gilead, you're teaching that in a senior elective this fall. Yeah. And it's a it's a, an elective on literary letters, letters. And, and writing letters, and one thing that you taught to your English class when I was observing was we do a whole unit on personal essay writing right. and writing about yourself. Right. And I love this, um, this style or this tactic that you introduced about in order to write a good personal essay about yourself directed at someone specific. So right. maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your dad, maybe it's your cousin across the country. Right. Maybe it's someone, you know, maybe it's Edgar Allan Poe for me, someone right. that you want to right. talk to. And that just helps so much in terms of writing. So how, how did you come up with that idea for a senior elective? Yes. Yeah, so that, and that's a Anne Lamott exercise, mm -hmm. Anne Lamott, a famous you know, writer and professor. And, and I got that from bird by bird. Mm -hmm. um, she says, uh, she tells a story about uh, hitting through writer's block and then 
deciding to tell part of the story to her brother and this notion of like, I want to tell you about how I loved the San Francisco Giants when I was a kid. And, and that, that just sort of unlocked, you know, things for her. Um, I guess, in, you know, in some ways that exercise maybe steered me a little bit towards the literary letters thing. I think Gilead did and just wondering and trying to find other epistolary novels. Um, I'd read Perks of Being a Wallflower forever ago and decided that that would be kind of a fun, um, it's not really a fun novel, but it, it's sort of a, a light uh, summer reading book. Yep, we were um, thinking of that for juniors this year. Yeah, oh really, okay. Yeah. Um, um, and then I realized that um, Alice Walker's um, the color purple is written in letters as well to to, to God. All all letters. That's there. another one on Hulu, I think, right now. Okay. The color purple. That's yeah. On there. Yeah. I, I think it won the Pulitzer and the National Book Award. I mean, Alice Walker obviously is an, an amazing. Um, and then Larry Malkus uh, introduced me to a play called Love Letters that is a staged reading, a dramatic reading that they just the two characters in the play just read letters back and forth. It was actually um, in Baltimore and. Uh, around Valentine's Day last year, and we went Dan and I went to see it. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the course, and so I, it came together from all of those different pieces. You know, the idea that yeah, the fact that that personal essay writing exercise, the kids always love, and somehow that gen always generates you know better products than the typical personal essay does, and and Gilead, and then just wanting to find other examples of that. Absolutely. Um, and we stick to the fiction, right? I mean, obviously there's tons of books, collections of letters, um, but I stuck to fiction instead of slipping into nonfiction. Awesome. I think it's going okay. How would you say, um, what's the experience like teaching juniors versus seniors? Is there, is there a difference there? And, and what do you like teaching, a, you know, teaching literature to juniors and seniors rather than maybe freshmen or younger students? Yeah, that, um, you know, it, it, <clears throat> Maybe it's sort of different levels of, you know, trust in terms of sort of handing the keys over uh, with the older students and and not worrying as much about how much I've how many units I've I've sort of gotten through. You know, I just I think about I, I've taught ninth and tenth grade and it doesn't have to be taught this way, but the, in my mind at least there's more of sort of making sure to get through a certain number of vocabulary units, a certain amount of grammar, sort of formal instruction, making sure that they understand uh, essay structure and uh, the, the frequent mistakes in writing. And you know, I've just felt, even with juniors, I think I've, I feel more pressure to prepare um, than with seniors where you're sort of like, these students have picked my class, hopefully. Nope. hopefully. They're um, interested. Yeah, they're interested. There isn't any pressure about you know making sure that they know how to do blank before they move. Up. I mean, you know, you want to get them ready for college, but you know, it's more just sort of like let's talk about interesting books. And right. uh, I mean, all everything I have my seniors write this fall is in the form of letters, mm -hmm. um, and I think they find that really interesting. Uh, does that get them ready for like you know undergrad expository writing? You know, probably not. Um, but I still think it's meaningful and, and, and interesting for them. I'm sure they're learning more about themselves and exploring themselves, yeah. especially that senior year when right. they're writing college they're, essays yeah. and yeah. trying to figure out what's, what school fits best for right. them and where they should end up. I think that, that's yeah. awesome. My senior year in high school, English teacher had us write a college essay as our first assignment. I'll never forget it. I used it for however many number of colleges I applied to and, so I do the same thing. That that feels right. That feels supportive, you know. Um, and we did that also in the form of a letter, uh, you know, that they wrote. They wrote a personal essay just like in junior year a couple years ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then and they're right. They just wrote up like a formal essay about love letters, but they did it in the form of a letter. <laughs> yep. Um, and I think they realized quickly that it's not that necessarily that big of a shift uh, it's just sort of like you're not just writing to your english teacher who you don't know very well you're it's not just an assignment for a grade yeah, it's, right you're it's writing to your dad yeah or you're writing to your sister or whatever yeah that's yeah. awesome yeah I th I f i'm teaching seniors too this year and i feel like exactly right there's less scaffolding mm -hmm. whereas with my juniors i'm trying to build them up to something and right get them ready for something right with the seniors it's like you know we can just hop into this conversation about what we just read last night and right. you know you guys you guys carry it i'll, I'll be a right. participant almost which right. is which is cool i like it 
Right. Yep. I think that that's the difference. And I've had a ton of fun. I taught I taught ninth graders at Drew. Actually, that was maybe my first time teaching ninth graders, and that was really cool too. I mean, it really it felt important to establish a foundation for or help them establish a foundation and pull kids in who felt like they weren't good at English, you know, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, and I, I certainly can relate to that. So it, that was fun too. I mean, it, you know, it's not all. I, I don't know that it really is all that different. You yeah, know, you just. You, you're just teaching. Yeah. You know, it's the same. Yeah. And they're, they're, a, a, the older kids are a little bit more comfortable maybe being vulnerable than the younger kids are. But, you know, most of those are gener- generalizations that I think you can find lots of exceptions. Yeah. What, and, and I learned this a little bit from watching you and kind of figuring it out my first year of teaching, mm-hmm. but what are some things that you did maybe early on in your career that now, like for me, in my third year, I've realized a few things that I was doing that first year that right. you know, I was doing completely wrong or, or right. now I have a better way of doing things. Right. What are some things maybe younger teachers <laughs> can, maybe some just guidelines or tips or just things to think about in your younger years versus now that you're experienced, now you know exactly what you're doing. Right. Are there any things that come to mind? Any maybe? I, yeah, it's so it's so hard. I mean, this is like, you know, trying to answer a question that you and I spent two years kind yeah, of yeah. navigating together. Um, and it's so personal too. Like I, right. I would, I feel like my, my most awkward or, or worst classes are when like I try to do exactly what you what were doing I was in yours. Doing, right. Whereas if I kind of took what you did and had my own right. spin on it, it was more authentic. Right. And kids kind of just see, see through authenticity right. and they know, you know, when, when something is more original to your personality. Well, and I think that the same can be said for lesson planning. I mean, I, I keep my lesson plans uh, for the most part. And it's nice to look back at last year, you know, because I'm teaching this literary letters class for a second time. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. But as soon as I start to try to follow mm-hmm. that, it feels inauthentic, right? Because the President of the United States didn't have coronavirus last right, year, right? right? And like we weren't in the moment that we're in. And right, like it. It's a different time. Right. And it's so. A different st- group of students uh, totally yeah. you know and so i'll use assignments and things like that and i'll structure things the same ways but you know it's always important to say what what should we do first you know and then how might we do this next half hour and then what what should we finish up with um and now of course we're doing all of it through the computer which is very different so i mean i think what you did early on and do well is uh like admit your mistakes and like say that you don't know the answer to something when you don't know the answer. And I, I think I kind of stumbled into that as well. I was pretty comfortable like being self-deprecating and not pretending, you know? Um, and I think students see right, when, when, when teachers are pretending, students see right through it. And yep. um, so being vulnerable and asking questions and sort of saying, I'm not quite sure how this is gonna go, but like, let's try it anyway, right? Like, I think students appreciate that. Um, sure. and, and sort of doing what you say you're going to do also students appreciate that, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, through. yeah, right. Like yeah. I, I'm going to post this here and then actually posting it there or whatever the, um, so, you know, it's a hard question to answer in terms of like, yeah, you know, what I've learned. I mean, I did it. I, I there's like, so many things, like right. there's countless things. You right. Can, you and, and, and maybe one of the answers to that question is this notion that you, that you must do these things. Like there was so much, I remember just feeling so much pressure early on that, I have to either get through this number of books or I have to have them write this number of papers. And, you know, I've told you the story about when Eva Turner essentially just looked at me. I was like crying in her office and she said, stop assigning so many essays. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Like then that was a like incredibly important moment in my like teaching life. Cause like, what, why, why was it? What, I don't, nobody's counting the number of essays you're having your students write. Like right. how about they write like one really good one in yeah. the quarter and you help them scaffold that. And, yeah. Think about how much more successful that feels for them and how much less burdensome it is for the teacher, you know. Right. Um, signing more work is just kind right. of giving yourself more to, to break down and grade. When, yeah. Like, let's you know. do let's do fewer things well. And, I mean, yeah. I think that's a good sort of just lesson in life, too, right? Yep. I mean, that writing more papers doesn't necessarily equal, like, a better understanding of how to be an English student. Um, so, awesome. yeah. Great. How about with this virtual setup? How's yeah. how's your I guess senior class? 
this class is really unusual because it's so small. I mean, I only have I have four Ten, four oh, students. Four kids. Wow, yeah, that's I great. Think, unfortunately, students are maybe voting with their feet and not signing up for my class. <laughs> um, so it's very weird. Like I, everything is is weird. In addition to the, of course, being on Zoom. So four kids popping into your Zoom. Total. For right. Every class. Right. Right. So like it's a we don't do small group activities. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> Um, I think they're 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 doing fine. I mean, I'm I'm trying to set up uh, interesting asynchronous things for them to chip away at. We just mm-hmm. did like a Padlet that they crushed, um, and getting them to, you know, I'm trying to record myself explaining certain passages and have them give me feedback on that, just so that they can do things sort of at their own pace. Um, and then we're doing sort of 45 or sometimes longer Zoom sessions that I lead fairly typically like a fairly typical English class and that's because it's not 16 students like we can just all be unmuted and all like talking together in a sort of natural way yeah yeah. um but it's so hard I mean you know you can't really get a sense you can't get a feel for the room and you can't you know I try to make them laugh and I'm not always successful (laughs) you know um it's all right it's it's hard it's it's a tough yeah tough uh setting yeah yeah um Comedians aren't even doing any comedy on Zoom because they know that's just not. You the, can't do it. Yeah, it's just not the way to do it. And they you would have, have to, to be, be in person. Yeah, and they would have to do a webinar too, which is even worse than like a Zoom yeah. where you can actually have panels. Yeah. So it's um, not it's not you. It's the, it's the medium. It's the, well, I think it's maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but this I've got these are great four great great kids and they're doing what I'm asking them to do and I'm just hoping that they can can dig into the literature a little bit. I mean, it it still feels sort of. Super, not superficial, but it just doesn't feel like we're connecting. I mean, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping with this podcast that students and faculty and parents can kind of see right. our faculty and like have some sort of connection with the people we have here. Cause we have so many interesting people that yeah. you can just have a conversation with and kind of learn a little bit more about them and right. how they're handling this, you know, this whole situation and, you know, get some of those things on the table. So. Yeah, it's it's for whom uh, the boys are learning, right? I mean, that, that's what we know from Michael Record. It's it's all about the the adults on campus, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know the the multi talented their their backgrounds from different places, from you know from different uh, upbringings and different sets of skills, and that's what makes this place what it is, um, and what you know what what really you know makes makes it so the boys will lean in and engage, um, yep. right? Yeah, it's the relationships, yeah, I think. And, right. You know, even though it's awkward and kids are in different rooms right. and we have masks on all the time, I think yeah. it's been great just to have guys around yeah. just walking around on campus. Yeah. I think everyone feels that way. Yeah, right. And, it, you know, we're taking, we're like doing classes at the same time, which is kind of weird. But, I mean, at least we're like within 10 feet of each other and that feels pretty cool. So next week, phase three, everyone's going to be going to their classes Right. physical classes but we have a and b groups so a on on day a half the students come in right the b students are at home and we we're going to be half virtual half in person which will be interesting but we do have the the owls we're going to be using <laughs> we're going to be using the owls the new devices have you have you used those at all i have not yet it's another used piece an owl. of technology we need to right. pick up we got to teach coach nostrand we have yes, we do. We have the i. We got an iPad too. Yep, we got lots of stuff. Oh my gosh, Mister Mister Campbell is keeping us. Yeah, we're hooked on up. our toes. Yep, yep, well equipped. So that'll be interesting, but yeah, I'm excited to see how the crew manages it, right? Yeah. And and get and get the upper school teachers talking to each other about what's working and what's not, right? And um, you know, are we trying to split the class, whereas, you know, the people at home are doing asynchronous stuff and not, like, logging in? Or are we going to be trying to do stuff at the same time? Um, you know, I think that there's obviously several different ways of managing it. Um, so so for people who don't know, you were involved in all of the conversations. This <laughs> su- you had zero summer, that, right? And, and you were involved in all the conversations this right. summer about how things were going to go down when we got back to school in the fall. Right. You know, besides being totally grueling and, you know, a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of changes that happen because things change every day. What was your summer trying to plan all this stuff? What was was that like? Yeah, I think it was – 
So I, I told the story the other day. I watched College Game Day, I think, this past weekend. And when they do the, like, picks at the end, mm -hmm. um, I forget. Chris Fowler, is he the guy all the way on the left? And I he's the so, sort of, yeah. like, main host guy. Yeah. He kept saying, tempo, guys, tempo, because <laughs> he was there and Desmond Howard was there. Kirk Herbstreet was at home, I think, and Lee Corso was at home. And the technology, like, was actually slowing them down. Like, they were... Hmm. He kept saying, we have to hurry up. Oh, because right? they only have their allotted... Whatever, yeah. it's like the last six minutes or something right yep. before the noon kickoff. And I think for me, it was like, um, like okay, like look how... F this is really frustrating. Like, we cannot talk to each other at the same pace, let alone like actually connecting with each other. We cannot like t say as much as we normally would when Zoom is involved and I hope my point is sort of coming through. I mean, like, yep, yep. It, it was really frustrating to no one's, no blame going in any direction other than just the technology. We're like, we, we cannot make progress about an extremely complicated set of challenges, in part because we're, we're just staring at panels on the screen, and it's like taking turns, like raising hands. Yeah. And, um, so for me, that was, I mean, all of this was like impossible, and, you yeah. know, child care and so forth and so on. It was all, we were making decisions we'd never made before, like every single day, and then having to change because something changed. Something and doing up. all of it on Zoom. Right. So and, just like. And as great as Zoom has been, sure. it's, just, it's just so hard yeah. to read body language. And, right. And it just, it just doesn't seem efficient for big decisions and, and big uh, planning, like, yeah. you know, going yeah. back to school. Right. Right. And I think just the definition of like rock and a hard place. I mean, like none of the solutions, you know, would appease everyone. Right. Yeah. Not, not everyone's going to be happy. Right. And, and in most cases, like no one is actually, <laughs> it's, it's not even like you're making a decision that like some people agree with. It's, it's still no uns one's unsatisfactory. Yeah. Right. No one's going to be right. thrilled. Yeah. But. Um, right. Because nobody wants to, sit in advisory all day long with, their mask with on. masks on right yeah right but it's something you got to kind of look at the positives and you, you guys yeah. did a great job yeah you know. i mean I, I yeah i mean rob was amazing and henry and and pete and and the the team um you know uh shanique and, and armand i mean those folks you know carried the heavy did, did the heavy lifting and i think we brought in some consultants who were terrific and we we leaned on teachers we did you know i mean and then all, all of the professional development right which i think you know ty campbell set up for us and um so a ton of like learning and a ton of progress and just like a horrific circumstance right um, right yeah you know, trying so. to teach all the teachers these new t like i feel like every day i'm here i learn some kind of yeah. new platform for yeah. Today I was talking to uh, Frank Fitzgibbon about because yeah. he's teaching a GOA course. Oh, okay. we were talking at lunch, and there. Do you know Slack? Like in the yeah. in the business world, people yeah. use Slack. Yeah, Danny uses that. Yeah. Um, there's something similar to that for students or for for kids that he's using for his GOA course, and he says it's fantastic. I think yeah. it's called Twist. Yep. So, they they mandate it. GOA mandates a I don't know how to maybe sort of an alternative or a secondary communication. Yeah, you know, whatever platform, platform. Or, yeah. yeah. So it's they. You know, so you communicate through Canvas, and you have to have an, another one. And I think most of them use Twist. Yeah, and something like that, <clears throat> I think, is a really good idea because trying to do everything through email yeah, or no setting way. up Zoom calls right. is just it's so clunky and yeah. not efficient. Right. But you know, a group messenger that just you get the messages from everyone. Yeah. Someone in your class asks a question. You can. You just, answer now. Everyone has right. the answer. You don't have to. You know, email everyone, but um, I mean the 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 platforms are awesome, like like Twist and what's the what's the face one we were just talking about where you make videos. Oh, uh, Loom. There's yeah. Loom, and then there's I think it's on your phone you can do it. Oh, uh, Flipgrid. Flipgrid. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's so many yeah. of them, and they're yeah. great. Yeah. But it's tough when you're kind of juggling all these different tools, especially if you're not comfortable with them. Yeah, and I think I mean I'm just really proud of the upper school folks for you know, jumping in with both feet and I think, you know, just kind of leaning into the discomfort of that and yep. like make, you know, sort of op opening themselves up and saying, I don't know how to do A, B, and C and working with each other, working with the GOA people, working with Ty. Um, you know, I think we, 
And that's the feedback that I think Rob and I got right out of the gates from lots of students and families was just like, man, this is really impressive compared to the emergency right. distance right. learning of like March and April. I mean, like yeah. it, I think our students They've definitely noticed, noticed the difference. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think it's just like it it's shiny looking. Like I think it's substantively improved, right? It's great. Meaningfully improved and thinking about how to do online learning well. Um, and part of that is that you have to create something that's like easy to navigate, you know? Um, and that's what we weren't good at in March and April, you yeah, know? For sure. Um, so. So maybe returning back to the theme of the podcast, yep. path, path to follow. Um, I want to <laughs> talk to our faculty members about like people who inspire them or, or where you kind of get your motivation or even thinking back to when you first became a teacher who kind of, uh, put a bee in your bonnet yeah. to become a teacher, to pursue this path. Because I, I really do think it's a calling. And like I, even back in fifth grade, I had Miss McVeigh was my English teacher. Mm -hmm. And I always think about this, but like the people that tell you you're good at something when you're younger mm -hmm. and you have no clue what, you know, right. which way is up, they say, hey, you're good at this. That just kind of like fixes you on a certain path. And Miss McVeigh told me, Hey, you're really good at writing. You like, can write. keep writing. Like you're you're mm. great. So then I was like always reading and writing. And, like my mom always drew pictures for me when I was a little little kid. So like I, I love to draw still. Like those right. those little things that people you know do for you or tell you when you're a kid, like they they stick with you. So was there anything like that for you or especially with you know with parents who are both involved in education? Yeah. You know what? what yeah, I think influenced you. I think I. I think I can, can relate to the people telling me that I was good at certain things, that those certain things weren't in the classroom though for me. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of teachers, so I had coaches probably that were telling me some of those things that were really encouraging me and, and, and filling me with confidence. Um, in the classroom, it was the folks who were, who were patient, you know, and who were in, like incredibly engaging. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, Dave Monaco is a lifelong friend uh, and he taught me ninth grade like world history and he just did crazy stuff like the whole class and, and it was the only way to keep like knucklehead ninth graders like focused and he was really patient with me. And um, I mean, I wrote down some names, Mike Smith. I, I had Mike Smith, I think two years in a row um, in English and, and he constantly quoted Caddyshack and like did other things that my buddies and I like, and I, I mean, I didn't get great grades, but I think I felt like encouraged and felt like he was actually listening and, and, and connecting with me. Yeah. Um, yep. you know, I think about, uh, I mean, my advisor was a woman who didn't let me get away with anything. And, and I try to advise like she, my advisees, like she advised me and, you know, instead of saying, great, like, I hope you take care of that. She would, like, grab my hand and, like, walk me to wherever the heck I was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. um, so really teaching me how to follow through or actually do what I said I was going to do. Yep. Um, yep. So, I, you know, I, I think of um, a guy who actually died after I graduated from Tufts. Uh, Gerald Gill was a famous history professor there and a big-time human being, you know, a, a larger than life and, like, really impressive decorated professor and yet he like made time for me and I wasn't like a great history student at Tufts and I wasn't probably a great, even close to a great writer, but he like smiled and like leaned in and helped me figure things out. And, um, so that for me, um, I mean, I don't think from like an intellectual perspective, I don't think I even started to mature until I was in like grad school until I was actually teaching and like realizing, you know, how to do it. And, and, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, starting to, I mean, I had a, professor at Hopkins that I used to like meet her for like coffee and she would like talk to me about things. And again, that, that, that's where I really started to feel. I think some of what your maybe fifth grade English teacher was telling you, where it's like, maybe I can actually do this. Like I don't have to pretend, <laughs> pretend to be an English teacher, right. you know? Um, cause I wasn't really a reader and I wasn't excited really until my mid twenties about, you know, um, the intellectual life. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was it was the folks who were patient with me, and 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 of course, the, I, I think I said some of the same things at the beginning of the podcast in terms of like my students were were patient with me, you know, and generous yeah. with me, and that and that's what I try. I've always tried to sort of give back in that way, of, and find the kid who thinks he can't write, or find the kid who doesn't like to read, and 
you know, I, I connect quicker and easier with them than I, I think than I do with the, the high flyers. Interesting. You know? yeah. um, and now that I've done it for a while, I can also sort of get with the high flyers. But early on, I yeah. was early on, I was just making headway with the. Yeah, you're like, hey, I was just like you when I yeah, was sitting here. Yeah. You know, my parents tried to get me to read, and I just didn't want to like sit still for that long. You know, I mean, I just. Um, yeah. So that I, I guess I, I have kind of a, I guess in some ways like an unusual path to to that. Um, to to this profession, um, and was just sort of around it so much that it kind of felt like the right place to be, right. and just had incredible teachers and coaches and you know uh, people looking out for me all along. Um, I mean the environment for sure, and then those those teachers and coaches yeah. who go the extra mile. Yeah, and for for me, very similar is like when I was. I mean, I've always loved English. I've always loved reading and writing, but. Right. I never really thought I wanted to be a teacher or, or a coach at all. And even in college, I had no clue. Right. And uh, I did an internship at Choate. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was I had a mentor there, and he was, like, pretty similar. It was this Choate summer program. But just, like, small things like this where, where like, I drove my car up there for the six weeks in the summer, so I had a car there, and my car had a flat tire or something. And, right. And, and I said to my mentor, hey, like, my car, I can't go to this like barbecue or whatever. My car's broken down. Like I'm, and he was, and he was like so excited to come help me fix my <laughs> my car. He's like, I've never seen someone so excited for that. And I was like, there's a different type of type of person who becomes a teacher. They're they're like yeah. willing to go the extra mile and help people out. So I yeah. think that's well, think and that's the way awesome. that they do it too really matters. I mean, I, I had a math teacher, and um, I might have told you this already that um, I was so focused on like my handwriting and, and like writing things down from the board that I would quickly fall behind because of, for whatever dumb reason, I just needed to have it look the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the class would be sort of three problems ahead. So she started, I would walk in and she just would like tap the desk, like come sit over here. And she would slide a piece of paper with like all of the problems already written on it or just mm -hmm. the parts of it that like, you know, obviously I needed to like work them out myself, but she would like write them all down and she would just slide the piece of paper over to the side and like walk away. And it was like such an incredible gift yep, that yep. she didn't make a big deal of. And Cause of course I was maybe like, well, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I can't keep up with everybody else. Right. But like yeah. this helped me, I just would fill in the whatever. I mean, I don't remember, I don't know anything about math, yeah, but like yeah. I would fill in the graph or I'd fill in the, you know, the, the problem. Um, and that was her just like, I can tell you're struggling to just simply keep up. It's not like you're dumb you just can't keep up with the pace right. just um, writing things down just yeah like, and yeah whatever just a subtle gesture to right. help to clear that and she didn't like you. tell me she was going to do it and she didn't like put it in a comment to my parents it was just like one tuesday these like piece of paper started showing up and you know she didn't need to do that and it, yeah. and it, and it was and it took her time to do it too you know um and it just meant i mean i'll never forget yeah it's awesome how those little gestures right. kind of you re, you remember those today, right. which is cool. Yeah. And another thing that that I just thought of is Miss Shepherd. I think I told you about her. She was my I think tenth grade or eleventh grade English teacher. Mm -hmm. And some some day in class, she was my European literature teacher, and she was amazing. She was like she was like in her eighties maybe, and she, when she was teaching us. And one day she started talking about the New Yorker cartoons, and and like I always was kind of interested in in those. And I told her that I, you know, I'm interested. And she, she was like, I have a whole stack of New Yorkers, like a wow. like, couple crates. And right. she brought them in for me to take home. Right. So, like, that subtle thing, like, influenced my interest in cartooning. Right. So, like, all these small things, I think, is kind of cool how they go a long way. And, well, like, and I inspires think inspires you. Right. And I think when you start to realize your teachers are human beings and not just teachers. I mean, because the things that we're describing are are things that good friends do and right. things that good right. parents do and things. Right. And so it's just it's seeing teachers in that same relational way or, or them helping you see them in that same relational way rather than somehow like teacher imparting, you know, knowledge on boy. It's like, no, I'm, I'm trying to make a connection with you. Um, you know, and, and those are the ones, yeah, as you said, those are the ones that we remember. And that's, a, that's another thing about Gilman that I think is yeah. kind of special to this school is that you see your your you know your history teacher out on the right soccer field and he's just being a beast out there it's like <laughs> oh okay like he's not just a you know super nerd in the history room he's also a great athlete right and he's also funny and he's also doing this on the weekends 
he's also into these kind of movies that right. I like too. Right. So like that that's that's one of the things that attracted me to Gilman was like the the triple threat yeah. kind of teacher coach advisor. I know a lot of schools have that, but it just seemed kind of unique here. Yeah, I think I mean I think it is. And I think that it's it's harder. It seems to me we're holding on tight to that, and I think some of our peer schools are not, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and sort of um, giving in to the need for multiple degrees and PhDs and specialties and so forth, and and then you know outside of school coaches and you know the the push towards specialization and expertise. I think we're you know we're still hiring folks that can connect with kids in the classroom and, you know, run the play or, or lead the model UN or be the varsity basketball coach. I mean, I think, cause we know that that's the recipe for, yep. you know, yep. sort of producing men of character. Um, and that was, that was it. I mean, absolutely it for me, um, you know, seeing, as I said, seeing Dave Monaco in history and then having him coach me JV football and, you know, watching him interact with his wife and have children and like it right like it was just like oh okay i think i have a sense of what being a good man looks like right Right. through him you know and through others and was for whatever reasons more interested in watching him maybe than my own dad right i mean obviously my own dad was an incredible role model but you sort of take that for granted and and the other examples are are very true and sometimes more maybe not more important but as important um yeah just as large of an influence right. on you right right yeah um yeah so uh, another question maybe when you when you're hiring people when you have people come in for a position at gilman not right. only do you look to see you know how they act and, and work in the classroom but where else that they, they could fit on campus right are there other characteristics or qualities about a potential candidate at gilman that you kind yeah. of look for when you're interviewing as an administrator? Yeah, I think we're looking for empathetic people. I think we're looking for people who want to grow. I mean, if you feel like you have it figured out, like I don't think we're interested in you because mm. how do you, you you shouldn't have it figured out as a teacher. You you should be constantly trying to figure out, you know, yeah. get to improve. So those I, I, I asked different kinds of questions around, you know, how important is empathetic behavior sort of in your life and and to you as a person, um, and how interested in, in growth are you? Um, you know, I think we want folks who take the work seriously, but don't, that don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah. You know, yeah. and um, and you know, it, the, the posturing and that it just doesn't work here. Uh, and so, those are I always ask questions about that. Um, I try to set when we when they make the sort of interview round. I try to set up conversations with the key administrators, but also with maybe folks. You know, if the person is, is interested in cartooning, you know, or if the person plays a, a, an instrument, I try to set them up with a, a, you know, a person that they might be interested in talking to. So we can we can really see that side. Yep. Um, I like asking the question, like, what does engaged look like in your in your class? And if the answer is like boys sitting still quietly looking at me, you know, then it's probably not going to be a good fit. You mm-hmm. know, like I'm mm-hmm. going to lecture for 75 minutes. Um so yeah, just those kinds of like, does, is this person, is this person going to really give herself to the institution and give all of her, who she is to this place? Um, and of course, still have time for family and that right. stuff off campus. But is she really just going to be here and get involved and be ready to grow and be ready to empathize with kids who have real challenges and real lives? Also, I mean, those are the, those are the things that we that we try to. And it's not it's not easy. I mean, we don't yeah. we don't always get it right, but. It's hard to really spell that out in yeah. you know a full day interview, but right, but you know, but there is kind of a feeling or a vibe that you get from certain people, and I sure. think we've, we've done a great job here with like our, our faculty and our staff are yeah. seem like people who are very engaged yeah. in in we, Gilman. We just brought in like ten incredible new people, and it, it's so exciting to see them, even in these circumstances, like get involved and invested in the in the school, um, multi talented. Uh, interesting people doing in awesome stuff on campus and off campus coming from cool places, parts of the world, you know? Um, so that's one of the, I, I find that one of the most interesting and sort of uh, fulfilling parts of the, of the job is posting the job in a way that is attractive and, and interesting. And then 
looking through all the candidates and then calling people and zooming with people and then you know, in the old world bringing them to campus and really sort of showing off like look at look at this place yeah, right yeah, we'd yeah. love to have you here right. um, and gosh you're gonna immediately impact like 60 you know Gilman boys um, yeah. that's a pretty cool you know yeah. that's a pretty cool and, and 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 how fun to talk about that in admissions you know meetings like we've got an unbelievable faculty like let me tell you about how awesome our faculty is um and you'll see it and, and you can feel it you know um so awesome. that's really fun brian thank you very much for <laughs> for being on the first podcast the path to follow podcast we'll have some more coming up we'll have cool. some more faculty members on but this was a real honor um and uh I'm not surprised that you're starting such a cool initiative. Uh, you know, I think we uh, we continue to be incredibly lucky to have you on campus. And as I've said several times, I learned a lot more from you in two years, I think, than you learned from me. So I'm really flattered to be asked and hope we hope we did an okay job. Appreciate it. You did awesome. Thank you very <laughs> awesome. much for coming on. <laughs>